Hi, and welcome. I'm Steve Martorano, and this is The Behavioral Corner. You're invited to hang with us as we discuss the ways we live today, the choices we make, the things we do, and how they affect our health and well-being. So you're on the corner, The Behavioral Corner. Please, hang around a while. Good morning and uh, welcome. Well, good morning, because that's the time of the day I'm recording this. But how you doing? Steve Martirano, your host on uh, The Behavioral Corner. As we launch into, I guess, this will be our uh, beginning of our fifth year on The Corner. And we call this a podcast about everything, because after all, everything is what affects our behavioral health. It's all made possible by our great, our great uh, underwriting partners, Retreat Behavioral Health. You'll hear more about them later on so uh you know to get started on this um in a nutshell we're we're taking a look at something that obviously a person my age and others my age and their children are going to be facing in greater numbers every day and that's um where mom and dad going to live what what's best for them going forward uh as their situation changes whatever that situation may be and so to that end we, we we were lucky enough to find ourselves uh, a gentleman who has uh, spent a couple of decades now dealing with just these issues and helping people make the, the proper decisions, and it's a big one, about senior living. To that end, we welcome uh, to the Behavioral Corner Dave Bailey. Dave is the senior uh, sales director of an organization, a company called uh, Brightview Senior Living. It's one of the nation's uh, largest uh, senior living uh, community facilitators uh, going and and uh, we appreciate his uh, his time and expertise. Uh, Dave, happy New Year and thanks for joining us. Thanks, Steve. Happy New Year to you as well. I'm uh, honored to be uh, your first guest of the year. Yes, and uh, hopefully today we can dig a little bit deeper into my past and my experience to share with everyone who's watching um, what senior living is, uh, how we get into it. We simply mm-hmm. grow into it, actually. And then how to navigate it. Well, that's 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 perfect. And uh, we should say at the beginning that when we tackle large topics and certainly senior living and and all that that encompasses is a big uh, as a big topic, we, we will uh, try to give you the uh, a strong framework. But there are a lot of questions that you're going to have to uh, pursue uh, diligently if you want to make the right choice. Dave, one of the things uh, I, w- I want you to tell us about your background to begin with, but I, w- I want to start this by saying one of the things I generally do before an interview is I'll I'll, I'll use uh, the, the University of uh, Wikipedia and Google and I'll ask it questions. I'll go, well, what are some questions uh, when choosing a senior living facility? And what I, what I was struck by was on the front page of Google when that query was asked, they would begin with, five questions you need to answer and then there would be 10 questions and then the 125 questions you have to answer and i'm going oh i see there are a lot of questions here so we're going to try to give people the broadest uh, but most definitive view we can about that tell us about your background in this how did you come to do this i'm going to go back to when i was a child um Three years old, living across the street from me was my Nana, Nana Graziano. No real blood relation, but our families grew up together, uh, intertwined into who was the best man at whose wedding. And at a very early age, I used to run over across the street. Nana would read me the Blondie comics on Sunday. And by the time I'm four years old, I'm able to kind of follow along the story with her as she's reading. And I'm not quite sure she's saying the right words. By the time I'm five, I realize that she's telling a completely different story. And by the time I'm six, she's just speaking back in Italian. Mm -hmm. At the age of seven, she's calling me Leonard, her son's name, who is 40 years old. We called the senility at the time. It is classic Alzheimer's. Somebody regressing um, in their, their own behaviors. And... That kind of made me think, uh, all of our family, um, we're going to accept this uh, as who Nana is, and we're going to laugh through every day. And she certainly did some funny things, and we were able to to laugh at them. But that was a very early seed that was planted in me. At the age of 10 years old, we take a trip down to Florida to see my Aunt Josie and Uncle Joe, my great aunt and uncle who were living in a retirement village. Steve, I have to tell you, I could not wait 
to be in my 60s and retire because this was the life. <laughs> Square dancing one night, shuffleboard the next night, cards the next night, bingo. It was, as a young person, being involved with all of these old people and being fawned on, it was it was terrific. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. My career then led me through uh, many different opportunities in sales. And six of my clients were assisted living communities. And at about the same time that I was managing these six clients, right around the corner from my house, two ladies used to walk by and I used to let my dogs right out the front door and they would run and kiss these ladies and and they were very kind. And Ada said, hey, Dave, can you ever bring your dogs to our community? And I said, Ada, I don't even know where you live. She said, I'm in a senior living community about two blocks from here. And it was a Samuel E. Miller home in Mount Holly, New Jersey. It was assisted living. And before I knew that you should actually have uh, certified pet therapy animals, I just put the leashes on the four dogs, walked them down there. When I got there to their community room, I took the leashes off and let the dogs run. And when my clients found out that I was volunteering, they said, it's time for you to make that crossover and come inside no. and work with us. Oh, so you, so you sort of drifted into this uh, out of a natural inclination and interest. That's fascinating. Uh, one of the one of the things that uh, is clear when when you uh, the more you look at choosing a senior living facility is like so many other things. One size certainly does not fit all. Uh, we use that term. Uh, kind of casually, oh, senior living or oh, a retirement uh, facility, and it's 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 much more um, not complicated but uh, diverse um, a situation than you might imagine. Talk to us a little bit about when you're looking for a facility, the options that are available for a family. So, Steve, if you look at this very positively, and at at the time that you're buying your first house, if you can project out in your life that at 90 years old, I'm still going to be very active and living in my own home. There might be a few things that you look for. A flat driveway instead of a sloped driveway, so that when you open car doors, they don't fall back on you. <laughs> when I go into that house, it would be great if it was a rancher, so I never have to climb stairs. If you think positively, you'll think of all those things. But of course, we think about raising a family when we first buy that, that home and how we're going to grow our lives. And those things don't really come into play. So at the age of 65, when you might be having some physical challenges, or really at the least, the family that you raised your home in has gone in many different directions. And what you once thought was going to be the hub of the family, where all the grandkids would come back, they're in five different states. So why am I paying for a five-bedroom home when there's no one there to fill it. So the first option really is to take a look at a 55 plus community. And the 55 plus community is the first step really into senior living. Many communities across the country offer great tax advantages when you move into a 55 plus community. Uh, you have instant neighbors uh, across the street and right next door to you that probably are in the same boat that you are in. Uh, empty nesters now looking to simplify their lives. Many of these now are homes that are just on one level. And those people who've made that move, the appropriate move at the right time to move to those adult communities are the perfect people who then choose to make the next step into what we call senior living, which would be independent living, assisted living, dementia care, and enhanced care. And the difference between a 55 and over community and independent living is with independent living, typically you're giving up the snow shoveling, you're giving up the cutting of the grass, you're giving mm. up any maintenance in the home. If you're in a fifth, if you're in an, an independent living community and you have a problem with your dishwasher, you call the maintenance team and they come to fix it for you. So typically a one price uh, type of monthly rent, or sometimes it's a buy-in community, but you have all of those maintenance issues of running a home taken care of for you. You also have 
at least one meal a day provided for you, sometimes two, sometimes three. And you also typically have a check-in point. So in the community, there might be 160 apartments, but every morning by 10 o'clock, you have to press a button or make a phone call to the concierge or the front desk or the security team to let them know that you're up and you're ready to start your day. And if they don't receive that call, they'll call you. Mm -hmm. And if there's no answer, they'll come and knock on your door. And if you haven't told them that you've left the community, they'll shake a finger at you. But if they find you on the floor, they'll call 911 for you. Yeah. Well, you know what I'm struck by? I'm struck by the different levels there. I'm struck by the number 55. I think that's when ARP began sending me their letters. And if, I think I'm typical of most guys at 55. The ARP letter uh, would go directly from the mailbox into the waste paper basket. At 55, what are you talking about? Uh, what What percentage of people who begin looking for senior living are actually that young? I mean, it is it's relatively young. It, it, are they the bulk of people looking for senior living or or is it an older demographic? So when you're looking at a, a 55 plus community, typically it's people who have retired usually between 55 and 65 who start looking, who realize that the neighborhood has changed around them. And it's time for me to find people that I have some Thing in common with. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But when we really look at independent living and assisted living, we're looking at an age typically that is, uh, I'm going to say around 75. Right. But it really doesn't make a difference what age you are. It's really what your capabilities are. And has this house become so overwhelming for me? Am I forgetting where I put my car keys day after day? Do I pick up the TV remote thinking that it's the telephone? Looking at things in my life and how I'm able to manage them, it might be nice to have somebody looking over my shoulder. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if I'm 62 or if I'm 92. If I need that help, that assistance, that guidance throughout the day, hopefully I have somebody in my family who loves me enough to say, hey, it's time to make a change. Let's take a look at this. Yeah, Dave uh, Bailey is our guest. Dave is the senior sales uh, director at Brightview Senior Living. He's uh, holding our hand through this um, difficult and uh, complicated decision-making process about, you know, senior living, when to make the decisions and where where uh, to choose them uh, to choose a place that fits. So that brings you. You've brought us into the different behaviors that um have to be dealt with it's not just uh do we like the decor or uh is the driveway flat or you know is it convenient do we like the neighbors it's all of that for sure but there are other factors that bear more heavily on this and you mentioned it to me earlier when we were speaking and you called these the behaviors that are associated now you've mentioned a couple forgetfulness uh and 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 those things uh, what what are some of the other uh, behaviors that would impact this decision? So, Steve, imagine that you are now 87 years old and your children have been calling you and you're talking about the other man that lives in the house and how he makes so much noise and sometimes he brings children into the next room. And the isolation that you have faced for the past 15 years you have become a hoarder and those four walls start talking to you. And this can simply be managed with medication, but you don't go to the doctor. And now your family is concerned and typically they come and they, they see someone and now they have a crisis on their hands. And they realize that, you know, we knew dad was a little forgetful. Oh, we knew dad was, you know, a little off. But now we have to deal with a situation. And many times, even a spouse will make excuses and hide the behaviors of their loved one as these changes start to occur. Many of these are uh, a metabolic change that happens within the body that causes these behaviors to happen. Could be somebody who's been bipolar and never diagnosed. And now these psychosis start to grow. 
from the solitude. Now we're taking this person and trying to move them into an assisted living community where they're going to have somebody monitor their medications. But we haven't really addressed the behaviors yet. Now we have to see, does this person fit into a community? Or do we have to seek medical attention to really figure out what the best regimen of meds are going to be for them so they can live cohesively with other people? Yeah, and, yeah I'm sorry, go ahead. No, and as, as you know, um, trying to find a psychologist or a psychiatrist, trying to get somebody to address these issues, uh, you'll have an appointment four months from now. And that's going to be a five minute telehealth appointment. And what that person can tell about you in five minutes over a Zoom call, good luck with trying to figure out a problem. And now somebody can be misdiagnosed. Medications are now being prescribed, and it really comes back to your general practitioner, your, your doctor, to take a look at the meds that have been prescribed for you because there could have been old medications from another doctor sure. previously. Yeah. And some of the behavior, some of the behaviors are also, um, um, you know, exacerbated because of the medications you're taking that have to be right. changed from time to time. It's on that issue of level of care that I have some uh, specific questions. Should uh, people looking for a senior living facility who have the kinds of uh, either uh, cognitive or physical problems that you're talking about, uh, should they ask about uh, specifically what level of medical care a facility provides? For instance, typically do senior care facilities uh, dispense medicine? Yes, great question. So when you think of assisted living, and I'm going to go back 30 years ago when assisted living kind of first broke through here in the United States. Um, this was really a time when people needed help. And you would see commercials where, where Aunt Sally just needed help putting her sweater on because there was a, a physical challenge she had and she would have somebody help her button her sweater because of arthritis, her, her fingers were stiff. That's the pretty way of looking at assisted living. Mm -hmm. Assisted living, dementia care, are the areas where people are going to get that physical help. Independent living, not so much. You just have help with the the facility with the that you live in, the property that you live in. But assisted living is where you're going to have help with your what we call your ADLs, your activities of daily living, bathing, dressing, grooming, food preparation, and medication management. In the state of New Jersey, all assisted livings have to be licensed to administer medications. In New Jersey, you also have to have a nurse or a certified medication administrator passing those meds to someone, staying with them until they take those medications, and then checking off whether electronically or by hand in a log that that person has been giving those medications. The medications also have to be listed from the doctor who prescribed them, the date and time they're to be given, and the dosage. Perfect. So yes, medications are administered. Yeah. Is there a distinction made in senior living uh, between um, dementia and memory support? Are they do they over overlap or are they distinct uh, situations? So they do overlap. And when we talk about dementia, dementia is the big umbrella for the the changes in in cognitive behavior. Uh, typically a decline. You have Alzheimer's, you have Pick's disease. There are many, many other types of dementia, uh, either brought on by um, a vascular episode, or it could be Parkinson's. And most of those lead to the memory loss. But when you talk about dementia and memory care, most companies, most facilities will treat those the same. And it's a, a very fine line. Some people with dementia have hallucinations, but have no challenges with their memory. They have challenges with logical thinking. But again, the memory is great. Typically, in, in most communities, they are handled in the same neighborhood. And it's a neighborhood that is typically separate from your general assisted living, because we're addressing needs 
in a very different way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I can see that there are so, so many things uh, of a medical nature that you meet. You need to you need to uh, come to the facilities you're looking at armed with that information so you don't make any mistakes. There are some other sort of, I, I would call them mundane, but they certainly aren't considerations. One is I would guess lots of people immediately want to know what the food's like. Yes. Yeah. And that's a, that's a, that's a big, if I don't, it, it, you know, this well from decades in the, in the, in the business, uh, you could have the greatest facility in the world. If folks don't like your food, they're not coming. That's just as simple as that. You're uh, done. Yeah. And you're never going to win with the Italian grandma who used to make her own sauce. <laughs> right. 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 That's not like mine. And he's never going to be happy with that. Are there uh, situations where people can make their own food in, in, a, in a facility uh, like yours, for instance, or other senior living facilities? Sure. In a community of assisted living, uh, there are no typical kitchens in an apartment. But what you can do is because we want the change to be as gradual as possible for somebody who's making this big move in their life, you meet with the dining service director and most communities once a month have uh, a dining meeting where the staff will meet with the residents and the residents will vocalize what they're looking for, what changes they want made, what they liked, what they'd like to see again on a menu. But this is also a time in many communities that I've worked in where the residents will say, I've got this great recipe. And now the dining service director will meet with that resident and say, all right, Connie, let's take a look at that recipe. Uh, I'm going to try to cut as much of the fat out as possible, (laughs) but hold on to all of the flavor. And next Tuesday night, we're going to serve this in the dining room as Connie's casserole. No, terrific. So uh, the other, yeah, the other question is, um, and I'm sure this is a biggie too. Well, okay, this is fine for mom and dad, or, uh, but what about Fido? What, what what about the cats and the parrots and the, and the dogs? Uh, it, it, it could be a deal breaker, right? If you said no, no pets. Yeah, yeah, it sure can be. The real deal breaker is when people come to visit me, what they really want, and I think Steve, you and I would agree with this. If I could turn the clock back 20 years for all of us, wouldn't that be great? Mm -hmm. Because while you're wanting to move to an assisted living community, because there are certain things you need help with, bringing your dog along and still having to go and walk your dog and then pick up after your dog is really the challenge. Many communities are pet friendly. Cats, parrots, fish, dogs. Mm -hmm. You can have that pet with you but you have to be able to maintain that Mm -hmm, pet. mm -hmm. You have to be able to make sure that dog or cat is getting to see a vet twice a year. And the challenge then lies in when you come to a community and all of your attention is being focused outside of your apartment to enjoy all the activities that the community offers, is it really fair to the pet? Where where do you, where do you fit into that community? So let's, um, Let's let's tackle this third issue here now and take a look at the decision makers here, which very often are the seniors themselves, but more often than not are their children or their family. So you have uh, another uh, stakeholder here. Um, and I would guess a, a significant voice in this entire process, and that's the kids or the family. Sure. What is a what is a, a, a you know first rate uh, facility? Uh, what is their position towards dealing with the family, which I, I'm sure is not a difficult, uh, not an easy task. It can be if the family has had some participation in the care of their loved one. If they've had to take on responsibilities of every other night. I'm at my dad's house because he calls me and he's fallen on the floor. When it starts to impact the life of the advocate or the person who is caring for the senior, they are more apt to look to make this change. When the child is not so very involved and they don't really know, you know, they never had that episode where they had to go in the bathroom with their parent and clean them. Mm -hmm then sometimes it becomes about money. 
and that stakeholder who probably doesn't have a pension like myself, mm -hmm. you know that many families will rely on what they believe is part of their inheritance. And why am I gonna make this big move and pay for this 24 hour, seven day a week oversight of care when I don't really think my father needs it? That's a big challenge. So if the person has had that hands-on experience with delivering that care, they know how valuable it is to find the right person to care for their loved one. Wow. Uh, Dave, how are, uh, how, are mo how are most of these uh, services and facilities paid for by people? Is it, is it uh, private pay, insurance that handles most of this? So, Steve, I'm going to talk to you about something that I don't know if you've, I'm sure you've heard of, but it's long-term care insurance mm -hmm. that is quite costly. And if you were a part of a union, if you had worked for a company that had a great benefits package that you could buy into, the long-term care insurance many years ago was extremely affordable. I talked to teachers who have moved in who have the long-term care insurance. They say back in the 70s, we started paying about a dime a week. And they said, oh, the union say, just go ahead and pay it and don't worry about it. It'll pay off for you in the long run. And those people who started to pay a dime a week when it went up to a dollar a week, when it went up to $10 a month, they started to shake their heads and some people opted out. But those who stayed in, who then needed long-term care facilities, such as an assisted living or a nursing home, some of those people have it all paid for. Yeah. 100% for the rest of their life, no matter what their care level is. They're the lucky ones. And uh, it's no longer a dime a month. That's for sure. <laughs> when, that insurance is um, costly, as you point out. And it, uh, I guess a word to the wise is you shouldn't start looking for that kind of insurance when you're 60 or even 50. You should start. And I know it's going to sound crazy. You should start looking for it at whatever age you can afford it, right? You know, around the age of 50 is typically when people start to look into it because they're dealing with parents now who might be facing some issues. And then they think about themselves. And if you're in good health at the age of 50 and start to enter into this plan, it might not be horrible. But Steve, some people think of it as, well, it's betting against myself. I hope to never need that. Mm -hmm. But if I do need it, I want to make sure that it's there. Most seniors today will rely on a pension. Again, something that I know nothing about, oh, only from speaking with uh, my elders. Um, a pension, the sale of their home, mm -hmm. which if you bought your home 40 years ago and you paid maybe 125000 for it, and today it's worth 400000 that's your nest, nest egg right there. Many times young children will say, oh, if I need to pay anything into this, I will. We don't ever rely on that. And then there are benefits that do come from the Veterans Administration. So if you were a veteran, if you are a veteran, I'm sorry, uh, thank you for your service. If you're a veteran and need this kind of help, there's a program called Aid and Attendance. And that Aid and Attendance can give a, re a veteran just a little over $2,000 a month. If you are the spouse who has inherited that benefit, I believe it'll pay you about $1,700 a month when you qualify for the care. Mm -hmm. There's a financial qualification as well as a medical qualification. And you can so as you can see, there's a lot of ducks. I'm sorry. The, the, as you can see, we said at the beginning, there are a lot of ducks that have to be in, uh, put in order. Uh, but this decision is important. Uh, and it's uh, emotional. Uh, and uh, I think, as you can see from our guest, Dave Bailey, there are uh, there are people that understand that and can help you make your way through it. Uh, Dave, yeah. Bright, uh, Brightview is uh, all over the place, right? We are an East Coast company from yeah. uh, Boston down to Virginia, headquartered in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, we appear on a lot of uh, best places to work lists. Um, Fortune magazine has had us at the, the top of their list for many years. 
And I'm very proud of that. We believe if we can create a great place to work, we can create a great place to live. Yeah. Well, we thank you for your time. You came to us uh, through through people who've talked to you about senior living, and they just raved about uh, the process that you uh, have described for us there. Any Anybody have any more questions? You, you know, you can check out Brightview uh, Senior Living there online. And uh, Dave Bailey, their Senior Director of Sales, has been our guest on the Behavior Corner. Dave, thanks a lot. I have more questions. Can we, we'll have you back at some point, I hope. Oh, anytime, Steve. Steve, I'm an advocate for seniors. Uh, I am entering into that realm myself. When I first started in this industry, I used to say I came to work with a hundred of my grandmothers and grandfathers every day. Now I come to work with a hundred of my brothers and sisters, but I have aged in place. I am an advocate for seniors. I consider myself an expert. If I don't have the answer, I know where to find it. So if anyone would like to reach out to me, if I can help in any way, uh, I'm always available. Thanks so much, Dave Bailey, and uh, Happy New Year again uh, and to uh, our guest and to, to you guys as well. Stay with us here on the Behavioral Corner through the new year. Got lots of shows in the uh, in the works and follow us and like us and, you know, the whole thing. Uh, and we'll catch you next time on The Corner. Take care. Bye-bye. Retreat Behavioral Health has proudly been serving the community for over 10 years. Here at Retreat, we believe in the power of connection and quality care. We offer a comprehensive, holistic, and compassionate treatment from industry-leading experts. Call 855-802-6600 or visit us at www.retreatbehavioralhealth.com to begin your journey today. That's it for now. And make us a habit, hanging out at the Behavioral Corner. And when we're not hanging, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, on the Behavioral Corner.